Remembering UGA interview with Dr. Jean Michaels, conducted by Fran Lane on January 30th, 2008. Today we're at Dr. Michaels' home on Cherokee Road, sort of in Athens, Georgia, and sort of in Winterville, Georgia. Is that right, Dr. Michaels? That is so true, right between the two towns. We uh, thank you for letting us visit today. And, and with that opening line, tell us a little bit about this great house and, and how it came to be. I think we'd learn a lot about you just from that brief description. Well, on this property, according to the uh, records of the town, there was a house in 1860. Now, how much of that house I have left, I'm not too <laughs> sure. But uh, by the uh, chopped uh, main two by fours, I got some six by eights in the basement and other, other parts of the house, I'm sure some of it is, is still here. Uh, it was renovated by the Johnson family and they uh, modernized it. And it was probably all uh, in the early uh, 1900s, or 1910 or so. And it's been pulled at and dug under and dug above uh, ever since. And there's some brand new parts, and we're in one of the brand new parts here. But it was a it was a great old house, and it's it it's when you drive down your driveway, it's like being in the country. In the country, well, there's five acres here, a, a small lake area, and a stream across the back. And it was probably the overseer's house for the Johnson Plantation because we, we, we know that the, some of the older houses have burned. And then there's uh, seven little houses around the uh, perimeter of, of uh, this house. And uh, I, I, I just as a, a little bit of a uh, archeologist, uh, I've been digging at these places. Now the part that I dig is uh, where the outhouse used to be. <laughs> Oh. And, and sometime we can go through some of the things from the uh, from the old outhouses. Be fun to see what you've come up with. Let's start at your beginning. Go back, tell us a little bit about your early days, your growing up, the earliest influences in your life. Well, I, I was born and raised uh, up in Indiana, born in South Bend and, uh, and, and uh, raised in a little town just outside of South Bend called North Liberty. And went to high school there and, and graduated uh, from uh, uh, the, the high school. The uh, area, of course, South Bend uh, has Notre Dame. I was getting it's ready a, to say, so how what, did we get uh, you down, down here? here? Well, uh, our... Uh, 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 team, uh, for our football team and, and basketball team, we were all called the Shamrocks. And you, 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 uh, you, you didn't uh, have another football team uh, that you favored other than the, that Notre Dame around. And you, see, you asked somebody about early influence. Well, uh, the, the, the story is, 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 you know, sometimes the things that influence you uh, aren't always uh, in, in, the, in the case of a mentor, mm -hmm. you learn from some people from a different way. And that was sort of way in, 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 in my family. Uh, my mother was a teacher, and my father was uh, a tool and die maker. Mm -hmm. I often say about, about my father that, that he was the most even-tempered person that I have ever known, always mad. <laughs> and he was. <laughs> And, but I had a, a very shrewd mother, and uh, like we might be going out to eat, and he'd send the food back once or twice and around, and she says, now you just watch and see how far that gets him. I said, that's your lesson to learn from that. <laughs> and I did, <clears throat> and he did another wonderful favor for me. Um, he smoked, incessantly he smoked. And we lived in a, a large country home, not unlike this one, <clears throat> Lots of rooms, and I hated being in the room where he had smoked. So I was so delighted that in, in life later on, when I tried smoking, it reminded me of the <laughs> smells that I had as a kid. I didn't like it, so I never did. So well, I guess mother was the influence, but certainly father was too. How, as we were 
mentioning earlier, how in the world did we get you out of the clutches of Notre Dame and down to the state of Georgia? I, I guess we always like to think we plan our lives. And I guess I planned mine, but none of the plans ever worked. When I graduated from high school, I was interested. In, matter of fact, I had a pilot's license. I got a pilot's license while I was in high school. And so flying, that was just something that, uh, that I, I wanted to do. So I uh, graduated from high school and uh, went to Purdue uh, in aeronautical engineering. And uh, I, I wasn't there very long. And an advisor one day said, now you want to go all the way with this. If you're going to be an aeronautical engineer and you're going to be associated with this field, you've got to plan your life. And one of the things we want to, you to do is join the Air National Guard. Six months later, there's some trouble in this world, and about half of that class got activated. Mm -hmm. And we were sent to Camp Atterbury uh, at the Air Force Field that was attached to it. And we were there, I was certainly less than, a, less than a year, and the whole group got transferred to Fort Benning down there at Columbus. Columbus. And see, I, I sure didn't plan any of this. <laughs> I'm thinking I'm up at Purdue going to college. And uh, uh, <clears throat> when my time was up, uh, uh, I, there was still... Uh, this was back in, in, the, uh, in the late 40s and early 50s that uh, th things were still not too settled in the world. And I really liked the Air Force. I had a wonderful job there. I did accident investigation outside the U.S. If a plane went down, say, in Brazil or wherever, there was a group of us that would go and find it mm -hmm. and find it. Well, anyway. Uh, stayed uh, in the service uh, for, for a second uh, enlistment. And during part of that time, I started taking courses at, uh, well, it was Jordan High School. Mm -hmm. I learned not to call it Jordan. Yeah. <laughs> Jordan High School uh, there in Columbus. Now, that's now a full-fledged college, but it was a University of Georgia Extension. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I went, th went there uh, and got ready to come out and got a hold of Purdue. Now this was still back when, when the South seemed to have a, a little disadvantage. Mm -hmm. They didn't really trust us all that much. So I said, okay, Purdue, here's what I've taken. What kind of credit can I get? And they said, well, you'll have to take the final exams and establish a grade in these courses that are out well, I didn't Ones that you'd that. already completed. Yes. Mm. Well, that told me they weren't too interested in my coming back there. and I wasn't so settled on, uh, on aeronautical engineering anymore anyway. And so I uh, contacted uh, the, uh, well, the person I contacted here was a fellow named John Story. Mm -hmm. uh, he was... <laughs> Mr. Story did just about everything. He did about person. everything back in those days. And he said, well, of course we'll take it. There are credit. He said, there's no question. We'll give you full uh, full credit for anything you've taken. So I came came up here, and I'd heard a little bit about the university. I guess uh, maybe f four or five years before, in Life magazine, they had an article, and it was a little bit derogatory, but the article told about a wonderful artist up in New York someplace had made a horse, and he put the horse on the campus and the students burned it, and there was pictures of it. And I said, oh yeah, I remember University of Georgia, it's the place where they got the horse. Well, I came down here and, and, and uh, uh, outside my dorm, there was a little square of concrete, and they said, that's where the horse used to stand. <laughs> Well, it turned out that Dean Tate had, had sort of uh, taken the horse because he said, they're not, they're not gonna burn the thing. And they tried to give it away. And some of the school systems here took a look at it. And it, it's not something you'd put in a schoolyard. Mm -hmm. It's got all kinds of, you'd have to have uh, a fence around wow. it. It's, you know, 
And uh, they said, no, it's not here anymore. Uh, it's down in the basement of old college. And I said, talked to Dean, and he said, well, sometime when I'm over there, uh, we'll kind of look at it. And uh, it was down there laying over on the side. Well, then a, a family uh, that, uh, that, raised, that uh, mines sand along the, along the river, that, that, that family uh, said that they, we could uh, put it on their farm, and I, it's still out there. I look for it every time yeah. I go down 15. 15, yeah, it's still It's, it's a beautiful old thing. Up. But it's my first recall of the university before I got here. And you came anyway. I, well, I wanted to see that horse. <laughs> That's the reason I asked about it. And they, 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 several people knew what that little piece of concrete was. They said, oh yeah, that's where the horse was. So you got here, Dr. Michaels, about 1952, is that right? 1952. What did campus look like in 1952? Was it Drab. Adderhold was just starting, his, or, or I've been into his presidency a little while, and he was in for building. Mm -hmm. And we had large areas that were just kind of left without much care. The only place that really looked attractive was the front quadrangle with that little group of buildings up there with, with the fence that goes around it. The old part of the, North that Campus. That old part of North Campus. But outside of that, it was drab. Uh, Reed Hall was uh, not occupied, but was just being finished when, uh, when I came in 52. Was, was Myers, Myers probably wasn't even here yet, was Myers it? came shortly thereafter. That was so one, I guess we were series. beginning to hit the time when some of the, the, the baby boom well, that little been, bit there. Been a baby boom, not until the '60s, but but those folks back from the war and, and well, there were a lot of veterans here. I came here under GI Bill. The that, old that, prefabs you know, that, over on. Uh, they were there where, where continued education is. Uh, that was mostly trailers, and they they went out within a year or two. Uh -huh. But that, that I, I now wish so much. I said, they were so ugly, why didn't I take pictures <laughs> of them? <laughs> they would have been so nice to, to, to see that area. Well, now, what uh, was South Campus, North Campus has not changed a lot. I guess North Campus has some well, new, with new buildings. Well, with new buildings, yes. But well, f fortunately, we've kept a lot of the old. But uh, uh, yes, it, 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 and what has changed, of course, we went through two periods. Uh, shortly after Adderhold uh, uh, left, uh, uh, we entered a period of folks who wanted parking. And we started uh, plowing up, because we didn't have a lot of grass anyway, and I said, well, it isn't landscape, let's make parking lots. And all through the front campus, uh, mm -hmm. if you couldn't park by your door, you didn't have any influence here at all. Well, fortunately, we passed that period, and we've now plowed up a few parking lots, and the parking garage, of course, has been the salvation there. Mm -hmm. But the, through that uh, through that period, uh, it, it wasn't as attractive as it is now. They do a great job now. Oh, the, it, it, yes. Physical appearance, and, and, and you came in 52. I had a yeah. gentleman write me the other day and said it was the golden time to be in school in the 50s at the University of Georgia. In some ways it was. In that uh, it was, I had so many colleagues because uh, at least a third of the student body were veterans. Mm -hmm. And uh, like we, we had not many television sets, but there was a television set over Memorial Hall. And we'd all gather around. And uh, I remember going in there and the president was speaking or something. And some of the young folks came up and turned off and said, hey, 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 no, turn the president, we're listening. <laughs> so the veterans were gonna stand up and say, hey, president, right? Yeah, well, and the veterans were a much more serious group. Mm -hmm. And even the faculty would, would make those comments that, uh, well, if you, you've got about a third veterans, the dynamics 
right. of the of the class changes. I had had a lot of other world experience, and and it was a different, often goal oriented. Mm -hmm. One of the things I think that was just so wonderful about the military, it teaches you so many things you don't want to do, <laughs> and one, one, once you've got those in mind, you know, all right now I I, I can I know how to go on with life. Kind of narrow it down and find something you do want to do. Do want to do. Talk about where you lived while you were in school. What was your residence on campus? The GI Bill wasn't going to be quite enough, and I knew it. And then uh, going home to Indiana after I'd <coughs> been gone for a long time, I, I, I moved in to Millage Hall. And uh, I, I was actually working for John, Dean Tate, but uh, John Story was my uh, immediate and they said, well, I can make a head proctor there, and uh, you'll have a little private room. And then along came summertime, and uh, I said, well, I don't know. Uh, talk to Dean what we got. He said, John says, I talked to him, and he said, why don't we try, you just, you just stay there. He said, we've got a 4-H group coming in, uh, and uh, well, the 4-H group didn't come that year. So I was by myself, living in, in Millage, Millage Hall. Hall. Um, uh, mother Poss, our, our, our house mother, uh, she was around a little bit, but she liked to travel during the summer, so most times she was, she was gone. And about halfway through the summer, John says, you know, I think we're gonna have to change because several people have criticized this business, you living there in that hall. So we don't know what goes on and uh, it might be bad. Well, before I was asked to, to move, I was up there in my room, and the room faces the quadrangle with, with the memorial hall on the, on the other side, and I heard this popping sound. And out the window and looked, and I said, well, you know, there's some kind of blue smoke coming over there by the transformer. And I watched, it got thicker, and I said, oh, I, I think that transformer's on fire. Now, I had the key to Mrs. Poss's uh, apartment, and I went down, and, I called the fire department and came back up. By the time I got back up, it was, it was burning. Fire. Well, and then I noticed the window had b broken out right there. But they were there quick, and I went over there. And he said, you called this in? I said, well, just as soon as I saw it. He said, five more minutes, we would have lost Memorial Hall. Goodness. Because he said the fire had already gotten in on that uh, basketball court area that's there. He said, that stuff burned so fast, if it flashed over that, we, we would never have been able to stop it. But we got it taken care of. And uh, two days later, uh, John Starr called me and said, well, uh, after what happened the other night at the fire, we've decided that uh, you did us some good out there. <laughs> so you, you, won't, the, you won't be asked to move. You were the hero. <laughs> But I, I really think uh, that that, uh, that we would have lost uh, Memorial mm. Hall uh, because it, the the these transformers are full of oil, and whatever had shorted them out, they were flaming Going up, up. It, and had gotten through the window. Um, so uh, I, I I was head proctor there at Millage uh, for uh, gosh I guess almost all through most of my undergraduate. But as head proctor then, I worked with the dean of uh, freshman men. And uh, working with him, uh, Dan Biggers, Dan, uh, oh, two or three years, he lived in Millage, and then they lived over in Reed Hall. But his family was coming along, and he, he'd like to have a yard besides that quadrangle. And he went out looking for a place in the country, and. Here's where I live. <laughs> so he, he bought this very place. Bought right? this very place and asked me at the time, he says, we got a little room upstairs. Would you like to come out and live up there if you're tired of being in Proctor? And uh, I did, so I lived upstairs. And then when I got married, this is about the time that Dan Biggers was uh, uh, getting ready to leave. He went up to Berry College. Mm -hmm. He was dean up there. Some people may know Dan Biggers as uh, the barber in the heat of the night. Uh, he played there, and he played, uh, there was a, a bicycle thing that was done here. Uh -huh. 
and he, he played that. Breaking uh, Away. Breaking Away. Uh -huh. he, he, had a, he had a rather extensive role in Breaking Away. But, uh, well, we uh, need to look for Mr. Beggars. Oh, I, I, I think he'd be uh, delighted. He and his wife. Uh, get, get, get to talk to both of them. Uh, she's a she's a Georgia graduate and and worked. She, she worked in the lab for my major professors. It's, it's been family all the way. <laughs> it is interesting how those connections work. Yes, and, and 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 you're you're not uh, you're not planning. You know, they they, they happen. And, and uh, I said, do you ever look for a house? Uh, well, no, <laughs> I inherited a house. Just, and I bought the house then from Dan Biggers when I got married. Just the happenstance is amazing. Happenstance, it? that's it. What was, uh, as a more mature student, were you still a football fan and were you involved in extracurricular activities here? Or? Very, very much uh, a football fan. Uh, Out of that Notre Dame tradition, uh, I guess. I, partly, I think that, and uh, the fact that one of my jobs that I got on the side was I worked, the faculty back in those days ran the gates to the football game. It was kind of a concession. They got money for it, and then they would hire a couple of students to work with them. And I had the gate right behind Reed Hall. It was real close to Millage, and uh, you'd uh, go over and work the gate for a while, and then uh, you, uh, as soon as you uh, closed the gate, you could stay in there and uh, watch the game. So uh, I, I did. you did get that. paid, Dr. Michaels? Oh, or you? yeah. No, you, you, got, you got paid. Paid and uh, got, a, got into the got game Got in, free. and, and, and uh, it, 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 it was one of those kind of pleasant things because this was the president's gate. And uh, I won't mention the politician's name, but we had one politician back in those days that did tend to, to, to drink a little. And he would come up there. Just and, one. Yeah. <laughs> well, this particular one always carried the bottle in. And we'd have to fuss with him and argue with him. And he said, you know who I am? And I said, yes, I do. And that's the worst part of it. <laughs> <laughs> but he'd put it down outside and go on in. <laughs> what, what campus politics went on at the time? I know uh, if you were here in the 50s, uh, late Korea and, and then into the Cold War and those kinds of things, but well, what campus politics like at the time? Yeah. yeah. I was during an, an interesting period in that I said there was a lot of GIs here, and we had a student government when I got here, and there was a lot of criticism. And one of the groups uh, said, good gosh, you know, you guys are so bad, we ought to impeach you, that's our... Well, the next election, the guy ran, or oh, the guy and a gal, they ran on a uh, platform that said, as soon as I'm elected, I will dissolve the student government. <laughs> That's happened several that. times. Died. And they were, and they dissolved the student government, and things really ran smooth for a while. <laughs> oh, what did you do for fun? I was uh, in, in, involved in, in, in quite a few uh, campus organizations, uh, Sigma Psi and a number of mm -hmm. others. And, and, the uh, science honor. Science uh, and, uh, and the botanical things. Uh, even back then, I used to volunteer for the uh, botanical garden uh, uh, around, and uh, most of the university. Uh, and I did. I loved to travel. It turned out in graduate school, I got to do a little bit more of it. But uh, uh, and my game, which got me through the service so nicely, was tennis. Oh. So. Uh, and if you feel, Great place uh, to be for that. Oh, I, you just walk out the side door of Millage and there were right. some of the nicest clay courts that, uh, that you could ever want. They're built over now, but... <laughs> I had heard, too, that there were tennis courts on North Campus at one time. Well, it, these were on North, the North Campus. They were where uh, the psychology uh, building... Uh, right. There was a whole string of them across there. 
Wow. And then, uh, of course, our, the old basketball building. Woodruff, the, Woodruff Hall. Woodruff Hall. The only hall where there was a wind factor. <laughs> and then, right. I can bury in there. Is if, if it's raining, better take a raincoat. <laughs> <laughs> That's the truth. What, uh, was your, what was a regular day like for you in undergraduate school? Or were there, there may not have been any regular days. Not too, too regular. Uh, most of my undergraduate, I, I was uh, say, the head uh, proctor in Millage, mm -hmm. and that usually took something every day. Mm -hmm. I did have a person that put the mail up, but I'd always go down to the mail room and see if it got in, and uh, I would have the keys that they would, uh, and uh, if there was problems, and if you had, if somebody wanted a story, we used to store things, I think if the fire marshal ever knew it, up in the attic. And most of them were combustibles, mm. and we probably never should have done that. And, and Millage, Millage is interesting. Millage was old enough that it was a frame building. Oh. You get up in, in, in there, and uh, it, it, it's, they, they hadn't gotten around to pouring concrete mm -hmm. like they do nowadays. It's interesting. Did you, and so I guess class, three or four classes a day, and then? Yes, back in those days, and, and I often took uh, some additional classes. I, I had uh, uh, interest in, in, in botany. The botany group, it was almost uh, a, a, a fraternity group in mm -hmm. the sense that we did a lot of things together. And uh, there, there were some wonderful, wonderful botany professors back in those days. That, uh, and one of them just died just a year ago, Wilbur Duncan. Mm -hmm. uh, he was Red, one of red them. Redheaded, Dr. Duncan. 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 Well, uh, yes, early, yeah. but uh, he had pretty well lost that. Uh, now, but, and and he, he probably was one of the greatest plant taxonomists that uh, I've ever had contact with. One of his favorite things was to stop in the middle of, he could do it in the middle of a lawn, a garden, in the middle of the woods, and he'd look at you and says, all right, name 50 plants that you see. Well, you'd get four or five out looking around and he'd finish it up for you. And he'd find them. <laughs> Goodness, and his wife was very interested in them. Didn't they do a book together? On they did several books together. She was an artist as well as being a decent scientist. So very often he'd write the book and she'd, she'd do illustrate, the, it. illustrate it. And she, she had that ability to reproduce uh, in, in, in as, as exact detail as you could uh, imagine uh, a flower or, uh, so that could be printed. But then he started uh, wonderful books and you didn't happen to bring one, no, that, was not, that, that just might have been one. Uh, wonderful books uh, uh, with, with uh, the old 35 millimeter slides. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think his uh, Weeds uh, and Flowers of Georgia is still the standard. Yeah. But, he, but he, he, was, he was exceptional, and there were others. What other faculty and staff people, and if you worked in housing, you certainly, and, and for uh, Mr. John Story, you knew a lot of those folks. Who, who do you remember and who stands <coughs> out to you? There was one faculty member, undergraduate. The man's name was Wilson, Dr. Wilson. Now, Dr. Wilson, though, all of his colleagues seemed to look at him with suspicion. But to me, he, he was one of the greatest teachers that I've ever had. Now he did things, he's teaching botany. And he said, it's a shame to only use the eyes to get to the brain. There are other ways of doing it. He said, you use your eyes and your ears a little bit, but you're going to use your hands to get to your brain. It's a better way. Well, all right, how do we do that? He said, well, what I'm going to do, we're gonna have art in the dark. Now, we're, we're, let's, let's say we're going to study onions, and then maybe we're going to study some other kinds of, uh, of uh, old daylilies that, are, that have different structures under the ground. And you think about them. 
Now we're going over to the art building, and we would. We'd go over to the art building, and we got a big blot of clay here. And they said, all right, do a small onion and a root of, of something else, and he'd give us some, a couple of this, make them. Now, it had to go in the mind for you to form them, how they were made, right. and where the roots attached. And you know, I still think of many of those structures like that. Another one was acting. You're a leaf and she's a stem. And I remember this tall, lanky girl, she was so pretty. I was proud to be a leaf of her stem. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we, we would, all right, uh, we got our attachment points, and what goes at the end? Well, somebody's a flower up there. And you, you, ha you had to keep in mind what you did. As a leaf, what did I do for the stem? And the stem had to explain what they were doing for me. And, and uh, you, you visualized and felt and you never knew what that classroom was going to be like. Well, there, there was traditional teachers that was, now Wilson, you know, too, what are you too, doing? Too far out. Uh -huh. But it, it, it certainly fixed it in my mind. There were things that I, I visualized then. The, the sad part was, I guess it was, uh, oh, just three or four years after I had him, as a very young man, he had a heart attack oh, and died. Wow. That he didn't have a long career, but any, anybody that had him remembers uh, uh, Dr. Wilson. And then, of course, Dean Tate. You know, everybody that we've talked to has, a, has a, at least one Dean Tate story. And, 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 and you know, <laughs> he was that story. In many ways, he was the, be, because uh, Dean Tate, oh, what is the Latin for... You're, 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 you're uh, the parent. Uh, in loco parentis. In loco. Uh, he believed that. He believed that he was the father of every boy and girl that was here. Now, once in a while, it got him into trouble. Yeah. <laughs> and he would, sometimes uh, we'd, get, we'd get a call, and the proctors, if he had to go to a panty raid, he'd, he'd call two or three of us, and we'd all go over to Reed Hall and see if we can get things straightened out. <laughs> How did a panty raid work? Oh, the panty raid, you know, you, you say, oh, a bunch of boys are coming up. No, no, no. A bunch of girls would call a bunch of boys and say, <laughs> if you come out our window, we'll throw, we'll throw them out. <laughs> <laughs> and and a, after uh, uh, you'd get a group in, they'd say, all right, we'll open the side doors. You can come up and get them. <laughs> and and you, you, you were trying to close doors both directions. <laughs> Uh, but it, it mostly was just uh, you, you're having fun. Uh, the one that I, that I remember so well, Dean Tate gave two of us a call and said, I want you to go out. And, and there was a, a uh, kind of a, a motel affair downtown uh, uh, where uh, uh, I think it's, it's, it's there where the Colonial Inn is now. But anyway... He said, uh, I, I, the owner has given me a call and said, we got two kids shacking up there tonight. He said, I, I need to go down and straighten it out. The parents would want me to do this. So we did. We went down and got the owner and he opened the door and there they were. They were in bed together, sure enough. And the dean walks in and he said, how disappointed. He went, the boy was a student here and we didn't know where the girl was from. And he started laying into that kid uh, about how, and he said, no, I'm going to have to tell your folks. Uh, and the kid kept wanting to say, and he, Dean, Dean, we're married. Dean, we're married. <laughs> and the girl was from Amory. She, They were married. <laughs> and it took a little bit of time. But then finally, even he repeated, said, say you're married. <laughs> yes, she said, oh. Well, I hope you two have a nice career. <laughs> and we went back out the door. <laughs> and then we explained to the uh, 
uh, owner that yes, that was all right. Uh, the, the, uh, Boy, what would happen uh, if that if somebody walked in today? Oh, yeah. they would sue you to death. Yes. Uh, but but uh, he said he did write the kid a little note. <laughs> <laughs> but he he wrote it and said he appreciated the fact that he was not doing something he shouldn't do. <laughs> because many times he got the opposite reaction. Current events of the time, I had mentioned earlier that I think it, Korea was, was winded down, um, and I guess it was, it was a time when we, we weren't thinking about wars, and but the uh, uh, civil rights movement was starting to crank up. That was. Um, I remember that so vividly. Uh, in that, uh, out here on Gaines School Road, uh, right there where uh, Gaines School Elementary is, that was a black school. And uh, I often drove through that area, and I remember driving through. The kids came out, and some of them were kids. I, I remember clubs and baseball bats, but I've been told later they really didn't have, they might have had some sticks. But anyway, I, I remember being frightened. Mm -hmm. And I came so close to getting out of there, right through the kids. I know I'd have injured somebody. But I have gone over to a number of the black schools and given talks and demonstrations, and a teacher that knew me came up to the side. She said, Dr. Michaels, I'll get you through here. Hadn't that woman come up there and gotten me through, I, I think I would have done something that I'd mm -hmm. have been sorry for for the rest, the rest of my life because I was frightened. And they looked like great big kids, but <laughs> I said, are you sure they're all grade school? <laughs> now, but it was, it was a large number of them, and what they were doing, they were demonstrating. But they were demonstrating they had blocked the road. Not what year would have this been, Dr. Michaels? Oh, geez. 50. Uh, yeah, it had to be in the, uh, th th this was while we were still pretty well segregated. It had to be in the... Uh, late 50s, early 50s. 50, yeah, late 50s. When uh, things were, they were strange here. You would Many have a different years. perspective, too, coming from Indiana and... What? So different, so yeah, different. What, what was your take on it? Because well, is, in, in the North Liberty, Indiana, there were absolutely no blacks. Mm -hmm. But as all peoples, I think we have our people we hate. Mm -hmm. And I was taught early that I had this group of people that uh, they stole chickens and you don't associate with them. Uh, my family taught me, and I said, all right. Uh, we had the term for them, we called them Pollocks. Mm -hmm. Oh my, well I had no idea, I didn't, I didn't know the Pollocks lived in Poland to tell you the truth. I just knew that these were the people we were, got down here and I said, well I, uh, wh why uh, are these black people Pollocks? Why, why do we, uh, I, I had no prejudice along that line. Mm -hmm. And then of course later traveling through Poland, I, also discovered I really didn't have any prejudice <laughs> there either. But you're taught, uh, it's unfortunate, but we were taught these prejudices and they're, they're terribly hard to change. I still get ashamed when I laugh at a Polish joke. Mm -hmm. uh, I, oh, I shouldn't laugh at that. <laughs> it's like the song in the uh, South Pacific about you have to be carefully taught. Yes, absolutely. I, I can remember hearing that song and thinking, well, I sure was. I was. I was. I was cruelly taught. I. I. I think. You were on campus then during the time that Charlene Hunter and Hamilton Holmes arrived to. Uh, and later a, became a, 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 a very close friend of Hamilton, his mother, and his wife. We tell, traveled together at the time. Tell I us didn't know Charlene mm -hmm. very well, except Dan Biggers had the task. We tried to put her in the uh, the dorm, mm -hmm. and we took a couple of trips over there. I could remember going over there, and and they were uh, uh, getting the uh, fire hose down. And uh, Dean says, "Well, if they got it out. Let's use it." 
So I said, we were going to spray down and get the crowd back from the door, and nothing. Turned around and went back, and some of the kids that were still in the hall had cut the fire hose off. <laughs> but uh, the, uh, uh, Dan Biggers had the task of taking her to a safe house uh, over on the other side of uh, t town. And uh, on occasion, he'd ask, you want to want to ride along? He said, things are fairly calm once we get in the car. And I've gone back. I I've, I've think I know where the safe house was. Uh, uh, and uh, gone back there a couple of times. I can remember the, the trips. But there is a kind of a famous picture, and I see it wherever I see uh, the... Uh, uh, details about that period and it shows Charlene Hunter looking out the back seat mm -hmm. of a, I think it's an old Chevrolet. Dan is driving mm -hmm. and I'm sitting on the other side. Is <laughs> that, that you? That's me in there. And we were, we were going off getting her over to the uh, to the safe house. But for for years I so admired those two people. Mm -hmm. I don't. I I couldn't have stayed here. I don't think. And I the remember. isolation after. I know. I think the the, the risk. Mm -hmm. There were. <clears throat> we had this group of people that had been taught to hate, mm -hmm. and they weren't getting over it, and they felt compelled. Uh, you, you, the, these were not uh, people who had a great deal uh, of, of just meanness about them. Some of these people were very religious and felt it was their religion was telling them to do this. Uh, it's a little like we we're running into now. Mm -hmm. if, if you have someone that has been taught all their life that this is the enemy, that's the enemy. And there were people that, that you, I, I watched folks throw stones uh, at the car and there's all kinds, they're not having fun. They're expressing the most extreme hatred they can. And it's, I don't, I don't, you can't reason with people like that. Mm -hmm. You've got to start early. You've got to stop teaching them to hate. But you know, uh, years later, after Hamilton uh, uh, graduated. With honors. Uh, with honors, and he, 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 he actually came back uh, liking the university mm -hmm. better. He, he would show up here at football games. and uh, He became a uh, trustee, I think, of the, found, the university foundation. foundation. Uh -huh. And uh, after he died, his mother and uh, Hamilton's grandmother uh, used to take trips. And I'm sure Claude probably remembers some of those trips they went on. Well, I went on several of them. Alumni tours? Alumni somewhere? tours. Well, how wonderful. I was on the one they went to. And it was so much fun to sit down with the two of them and talk to them about, well, did you remember this? Or well, what happened at that event? Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, I, we were there. Uh, there's one that we, we all we, we laugh about uh, going into... Uh, the the main campus right by the arches there's a kind of an administration building there mm -hmm. and around and uh, they had closed it because the kids were were uh, demonstrating outside well the paper people came the newspaper and there was anybody outside and they started rounding up kids that would stand out there and wave your arms and shout so we can take some pictures. So we came all the way from Atlanta, we gotta get some pictures. Mm -hmm. And and that was there uh, said, University of Georgia students demonstrate. <laughs> and he said, oh, yeah, I was there at that demonstration. <laughs> it was put together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit, we've, we've not touched on your academics and your, your studies here much. Talk a little bit about your What's your academics? I have a list of your degrees, and and you. Well, when I when I got out of the service, I I, I really didn't uh, didn't uh, want to stay with uh, aeronautical engineering, especially after Purdue uh, didn't open uh, with didn't uh, greet me with open arms, 
and came up here. I had another interest, uh, it was botany. So uh, I, I majored undergraduate in, in botany. But there was a wonderful man here called Julian Miller, Dr. Miller, the botany building is named right. after him. And I said, well, I do want to study uh, botany, but I want to study under Dr. Miller because he, his area, he was in plant pathology. So uh, there's the, the, the committees that they have. They, someplace I've got this letter, it says, you may major in arts and science and take your so many courses under Dr. Miller. And uh, I worked summers for him. Because again, I was just going on GI Bill and during the summer things got uh, sort of slack because you didn't get the bill when you weren't in, in school. And uh, so that I did, uh, did botany for my undergraduate. And then <clears throat> as I was getting into the uh, material with Miller, Miller worked with plant diseases. And I wanted to work with plant diseases, but I was certainly more interested in uh, human diseases, and is a field uh, that, that, that leads to, to, to more into human diseases. So I worked on my master's and I worked in, in, my, in uh, microbiology, and then when I got my master's degree, uh, the, the part I was working on was, uh, was uh, yeast infection with women. Mm -hmm. and I spent quite a bit of time uh, w working with uh, with uh, the yeast infections. So they said, we, go ahead and get your master's and then you can start your doctorate degree uh, and, and switch over to what they call medical mycology. That's fungal diseases uh, of the human being and other, and other animals. And that's what I ended up doing for my doctorate, was doing the, the uh, medical mycology. Didn't plan it a bit, it just worked out it that way. It just happened. Happenstance again. It sure was. Talk about your, in your early career, you finished your, your doctoral degree, <laughs> and you had probably, I'm guessing you were working as a grad assistant during that time, teaching. I was, but there's something that has served me well. During my uh, master's degree, there was a one course over in a business school that I thought I just ought to go ahead and take. And it's called personal finance. And I took that course and got some wonderful ideas. Now I took some extra time. I, uh, I have almost six years after my master's before I got my PhD. Mm -hmm. Well, there's some other extenuating circumstances because I, I took one year off and went to LSU Medical School to, to strengthen an area that I felt I, w I was weak in. But I started buying houses. And by the time I got my PhD, I was worth just a little over a million dollars. And Come help you know, me balance my checkbook, <laughs> Dr. Michaels. That, that just, just by, and, and if I hadn't had that course, which gave me some direction, and then th uh, a, a college town is just such a wonderful place for development. Uh, and I, you see tremendous amount here, but I believe we could absorb it all. I think every bit of it as it goes along. You know, as every year we increase in size, you know. Adams thought there for just a little bit, he said, we'll level off. And just as soon as he got those words out of his mouth, the legislature said, oh, they're leveling off, so they don't need an increase in money. And uh, he, he quickly changed that. He said, no, didn't talk about that anymore. Huh? We'll grow. <laughs> we'll grow. You're, and, you're, do you, are you the, the university landlord or do you renovate a home and sell it? How did you? I do buy and sell, but only when I find a piece of property that it looks like you could never make money. Uh, and there are some, I'll give you an example in a second. 
But uh, what, what I've done over the years is collected rentable property and tried to upgrade. I, I, I don't take a lot from the business. As a matter of fact, I don't own any of these houses. A company owns them that I happen to be the president of the company. Uh, there's advantages. Uh, if you want to call and get something fixed, I don't want to know in the middle of the night your toilet doesn't flush. You call the, the people that, 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 that do that uh, around. But the development of, of property, if you keep it up, you don't need a lot of money. I've often told my students, there are some very good reasons why students should not go to college. Because if they all did, who would do the plumbing, the carpenter? Mm -hmm. out? We need these skills, and, and some of them pay very well. But money should never be the excuse not to go to college. Because you can go to college, and you can earn money, and you can come out not with debt, but with a sizable amount of money saved. Well, I'll say. If you're an example, I will say. Um, I, the way I remember you from, from days past was as the, as the shining light behind the State Science and Engineering Fair. Is that something that you just had responsibility for briefly or? Fifteen years. <laughs> that was just briefly, wasn't it? Jack Payne, who was our Dean of Arts and Science mm -hmm. for a while, uh, he had a concept that, that served very well, and I was able to take it and make use of it, that there's two ways to go out and recruit good students. You can go out to the high schools and meet with large groups of students. But wouldn't it be smarter to come up with some way to get the cream of the crop, the best students in the state, to come up here and then sell them on the university while they're mm -hmm. here? Uh, you mentioned the one program. I also did the History Day program. I, I did the, uh, the uh, symposium, uh, which is for uh, the top students in the state to participate in a symposium. That's uh, actually uh, financed by the military. Uh, mm. um, several thousand uh, students. And then we, we, uh, we also, in an office that I held here, used uh, uh, for uh, teaching college courses in, in, uh, in high school. And we would teach those teachers when they would... Would uh, that be like the AP courses? The they? AP courses were certainly one of, the, one of the big things, and we still do. Now, I brought the History Day program and the symposium here. Jack Payne brought the science fair. But I was in school, and they, one of the first things he said, I want you to judge at the science fair, <laughs> all right. And then as, as I judged over the years, I uh, finally became the, uh, the director. And, but we were bringing those bright kids. Mm -hmm. And then we'd have tours all over the campus. Well, the kids thought they were here to participate in the science fair, and they were. But for our thinking, they're here for us to observe and then recruit. Mm -hmm. And to see uh, what we had to offer for well, them, right. Often their parents would come. Right. Sell the parents, and you've often got students. And there yeah. were, you would have hundreds of students, we'd what have, I remember. Well, we'd have thousands of students yeah. uh, in, the, in the program before. Um, uh, because you start with them down in the in the schools, uh, they they've won at two fairs before they ever get here, mm -hmm. and then we'd send them on uh, to to the international fair. What I guess to follow along this line, what accomplishments are, are you most proud of in your in your time at the University of Georgia? Oh. Of what? I, I, th I think working uh, with these various programs, they certainly were uh, rewarding. And then the return I have. Uh, we, we can uh, put out a mailing and uh, 
Uh, matter of fact, the last uh, request that the Arch Foundation had for funds, it was one of the letters they had me sign. And I'll hear back from those, those students uh, around. Uh, some other things, I, I, I've published a, a number of things over the years. Uh, I've, I've gotten three U.S. patents, still have one. Wow. When we go out, I'll show it to you. It's still on the wall. Uh, but these, uh, th these are things that one, I think, owes to the university. You use your uh, degree uh, to, to serve. And, and I've often been pleased that uh, I, I've been able to accumulate enough so I can get some back. Mm -hmm. I, I think that uh, that's a, a rather pleasing way of saying thank you to the institution. Uh, uh, the I, development I folks will want us to save that that paragraph that you just spoke, Dr. <laughs> Michael. <laughs> well, uh, it, it seems to work. Uh, the, uh, <coughs> there's, there's placards now in the buses. I don't know if you see them or not. It's got my picture. It says, he not only looks like Santa Claus, he gives like Santa Claus. <laughs> I've and, seen that. You know, uh, I'll show it. i got a couple around here. Well, uh, why, you say, what did I teach? I taught pre-meds, pre-vets, dental. These are the professional kids, and now they're just about at their earning height. Right. They've got those resources. The resources. So uh, they, they pick on you to go out and, and be the rep. Remember him in class? Right. Well, give to the university. Right. Talk a little bit. You've been here in Athens and uh, around the University of Georgia for over 50 years. Yes, I guess it has been since 52. It's been over 50 years, right. As you, from your perspective, as you look back over that time and, and with your involvement at the university, what do you see as some of the three or four major high points here? Well, there certainly have, have been uh, things that have occurred that have been both uh, high and low points mm -hmm. for, for, for the university. Uh, certainly the, the uh, additions and the decision to to increase the size uh, of, of the university. And, and then we had that long period where uh, we, we didn't build any dormitories. And then we just recently came back with dormitories uh, much improved over the old ones. And I, I'm, I'm a very strong believer in trying to evolve the students in the campus, with the campus, with campus organizations. Mm -hmm. Uh, being a, a, a suitcase college, uh, for, for example, Emory is a little bit that way. Everybody goes home, mm -hmm. and then you're away from the campus. Uh, I, I used to try to get my students to study together. And one of the things I'd often ask them is, you've got to learn from each other. And I may very well ask you to name 10 students by, by, by name in, in this class at some time. So you could know some people. Mm -hmm. And then it's all right. I'll get up, and and once they know each other, then they help each other. Um, but uh, I I can think of uh, when the uh, first Bush uh, came here on mm -hmm. campus, and he expressed uh, such a surprise of what we had here. Uh, I kind of contrast that to uh, when Sopkin uh, was, was uh, director of the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra and he had, uh, uh, the orchestra was over here and they played uh, in that old theater. And afterwards, he just came out and stopped there a minute and you could tell he was trying to think, should I, yeah, I said, I, he said, this is the last time I'll play in this place. This is such a bad, well it was uh, acoustically and, and, and I think he did a wonderful thing for us because thereafter he said, we got to start saving money for it. And we came up with wonderful facilities mm -hmm. years later. Now, now we have people stand on the stage and say, what a great place to, mm -hmm. to uh, put on a program. So sometimes you've got to be bad before you're good. 
have to hit those low points you sometimes. You gotta hit to, those uh, those low, po low to points to get back to the high points. Um, Talk a little bit about uh, two time periods that come to mind to me: the the sixties and se early seventies, when there was uh, some stu certainly student unrest in the United States. And I think we're always the cow's tail. We sort of get there last. But there was a period when. Uh, did, did you re recall what, what happened up there on front campus? We had a little tent city. Mm -hmm. And uh, they started out by putting the tents up right in front of the archers. You know, this was a pain because you're down. And, uh, but, but they had won the right. They went to court and they had won the right. That, that this was part of their uh, freedom of expression. But they went back and revisited that, and the judge says, yes, but you're going to have to move off the sidewalk. <laughs> <laughs> so they moved their tents off of the sidewalk, and they were there, gosh, for months. I remember how bad some of them smelled. We went over there. Was <laughs> it? you got to remember that. <laughs> and it, uh, it, it was a time when there was unrest and the students wanted some way of, of, uh, of expressing it. And at that time, the, the kids were, were when, they, when they wanted a public forum, and we got a much better one now uh, down by the bookstore, yeah, the where the, at that Tate Center, uh, where it works, I think, for, as far as the students are concerned, uh, is a better place. But they, they, they'd speak at the arches. Mm -hmm. And uh, there'd be somebody up there uh, with, a, with a point of view. Uh, you know, it, 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 it was a time when, uh, let's say, there was a lot of, a lot of student uh, unrest. Uh, a lot of change going on. And I, I remember Dr. Uh, McBee talking about uh, folks marching around and, and uh, carrying a little casket that had the women's rules in it and those kind of things. And, and the world really changed substantially during that time. And you mentioned earlier in Loco Perennis, that went out the window at that point. So. It, it sure did. And, and when we look back now, and the, we said, well, gee, what was the good of doing those kinds of things? The one that I, I particularly remember was what the girls had to wear over their shorts when they went to play tennis. Wear your raincoat. <laughs> wear your raincoat, you certainly don't want. And, but yet, if you look at crimes against women, they didn't suddenly shoot up when the raincoat came off. No. So the raincoat must not have been doing that much good. <laughs> it, was a, it was a new day. Yes. Well, let's move into the 80s. And at that time, I think um, I was uh, at work here at the time. And I, I remember the morale being very low. It was about 1986 and the Jan Kemp affair. What, describe that, define that for us, and then give us some idea of, of if you can, of, of what your recollection of, of the way things worked. A name has slipped my mind. Our, uh, the woman that was in uh, the, uh, the- Virginia body, Trotter. Virginia Trotter. Uh, and I shouldn't forget it because if you look at the schemat of, of how uh, the university is set up. Uh, there was, from Virginia Trotter, there were lines and then everybody was out here. Well, there was a little old line that went down right underneath Virginia Trotter, and it went down to an office called Special Academic Programs. That was the office that I ran. And she did it that way, because it came, came to her that way, or left it that way, because she said, so often, yours is experimental. I want to see it first, and then we maybe we'll do something with it. And that's what I brought in the History Day program and so this. Now. So you reported directly to Dr. Trotter? I or? reported direct, directly to Dr. Trotter, and bless her heart, I bet some years would go by and the only time I would see her would be Christmas because she needed help setting up the creches. <laughs> and I'd go out to, out to the house and help her set up creches. But uh, she, she uh, w w sometimes wanted to know, is this working? 
or what we're doing and why are we doing it around. She was goal-oriented and there were times when maybe those goals didn't exactly fit the goals of the president and, and, and the university. But uh, you, you keep quiet about that. You just, okay, we'll see what, how Virginia wants to, wants to play this. At that time, I had this office, and she pulled me out of the department. She said, You're, you'll just get in trouble down there. If you would like to teach a course, that'd be fine. You go ahead and teach a course for the, for the department. You want your lab in there, that, that, that's, uh, that's fine. I'll set you up for the secretary, and we'll have a room, and uh, uh, all right. Well, the department head, uh, he, he said, well, you got your office, but your secretary up there, she's taking up a room that we could really use. And I said, well, uh, I, I've got to have that person. for the." So he wrote to Virginia Trotter. He made a mistake of writing. I think a telephone call wouldn't have gotten in near as much hot water. But Virginia wrote back and she said, I am the property custodian of this university. You are not. I will tell you what rooms you have. And I understand you have an office. Now she's talking to the department. That you have a departmental office and then a, 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 a research office close one of them and don't ever ask me for my space. And he called me in the office and he says, I didn't know she had that side to her, but she sure did. And it showed sometimes. Uh, she was very territorial. Do you think that was part of the, of the camp? Oh, sure. Situation? I think it was part. A and... Uh, camp was a challenge to her. I think it could have been handled better, uh, certainly. Uh, and camp uh, was, was, she was not a, a rational thinker when it came to supporting her university. She was a very rational thinker when it came to supporting camp. Mm -hmm. And when those two were in conflict, uh, she wanted the university to move. So she had determined that there was some there were some irregularities in terms of the way the grades were uh, given to certain uh, athletes. Is that right? By the time she came along, we had gotten much better at that than we used to be. <laughs> Back in the days when Wally Butts was here and he was going up there and getting those coal miners to play football for us, a lot of them couldn't read and write too well. So they took a lot of help to get through courses. And it was just thought, if we're going to compete, everybody else is doing this, we better do it too. And uh, he had a degree of success, uh, right or wrong. I mean, it's not a moral judgment. Uh, Wally Butts is known for having won some games. Uh, he wasn't always my ideal, and we had such wonderful people to follow him. But anyway, uh, it, it was still uh, thought of to favor if you could. Uh, if an athlete uh, ha has a game, can you make some arrangements? And sometimes a, a coach would call, can you help on this? I, I, I had some, uh, both the basketball and, and track people in my courses. And uh, they ask, can you, can you help us here? Never was I told to change a grade. And if I could help, uh, yes. This person was needed at that, at that time for a meet or something. And we might give a, a test early or late or, or, or some other uh, uh, arrangements. Well, is this showing favoritism? Sure it is. Uh, do I think it was terribly wrong? Uh, well, they were getting an education, and uh, sometimes that education pays as well as, you know, uh, I, don't, I don't know how many personalities Herschel Walker has, but I tell you, it was that football player that earned the money. That's the truth. That's going to be interesting to see, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> um, 
the, the Kemp affair, I think, was particularly distasteful. Uh, uh, just across the board, and everybody well, sort it, of it shared Well, it got Virginia lines. fired. Yeah. And not only fired, but fired in, in, the, in the most humiliating. Do you know they wouldn't give her emeritus status for years and years? Mm -hmm. She couldn't check a book out of the library. Now, they probably had some justification one way or the other, but uh, it, 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 did, it did get her fired. Well, it was a, a, a low morale time across campus, it I was, think, in so many ways. It was. It was a little bit like uh, the Dooley Adams situation mm -hmm. around. And uh, I came out on the short end there because I, I wrote Adams with all the arguments I could think of that, that, that uh, to keep Dooley for that extra year. And uh, he asked me what time to come in the office. We'd talk about it. And I very immediately said, you absolutely have the legal right to do this. But the damage that it would do to the university. Can't we do it different? Can't we modify? Mm -hmm. You know, both of them had dug their heels in by that time. And they, they couldn't. If we could have seen it ahead of time and talked to both of them, uh, they, they, they both had, had simply come up to, uh, it's going to be this way, it's going to be that way. And the line was drawn. The line it? was drawn, and, and uh, I had, uh, by this time, I had so much interaction with, with Vince and Barbara that uh, uh, I... I <laughs> I've often said I, I don't mention the name of the other in their presence. <laughs> so. Talk a little bit about that. Is I know Coach Dooley is a wonderful plant person. Was that oh. what your connection was, Dr. Michaels? Or no, no. Uh, my connection went back. Uh, I, I worked uh, when they when they were planning uh, the Olympics here. Uh, I had volunteered to work with some uh, committee things, and uh, uh, I, I had. Uh, I had uh, known him for uh, uh, coming and, and talking to uh, a group that I was the, the president of a, of a, of a uh, biology society. And, uh, and then, uh, I'm not too sure how we got going on it, but uh, uh, we've taken several trips. And uh, uh, it, it, it's one of, those, one of those things where uh, we worked so so well together. Uh, we took one trip up the Amazon. Uh, we, we were two, about th three weeks, I think, uh, going up the Amazon River. On a, on a, there was only uh, about twelve of us on a boat, so you, that you, you, fabulous. you get you get to t uh, talk to them in the evening. And uh, uh, he was so interested in learning botanical things, uh, so we'd go out and identify them and. Uh, and later on, I sent him several plants. Many of the plants that he has uh, came from here. I'd gotten from Dean Tate. Uh, uh, Dean Tate uh, was interested uh, in plants that had been brought over uh, and, and are planted at the Oglethorpe Plantation. See, Oglethorpe thought that we ought to have all kinds of things in here. So he brought a lot of plants and, and, and also plants that he thought silkworms could live on. Uh, that turned out to be a total failure, but uh, they didn't know what uh, it was going to be. And uh, I still have here on, on, on the premises uh, a number of amaryllis that were brought. Uh, for, they were called them Dutch amaryllis. Well, there, there was no amaryllis in, in, in uh, uh, Holland. They all came from this mountain area in Peru. And uh, uh, Vince and I talked about it and said, all right, if we get this close, let's go up there and see that area. And we did. Oh. And we found them. They were there. Oh, wonderful. And of course, what the Dutch had done, they'd taken them from there, taken them to Holland, started growing them there and produced the bulbs and, uh, and then sold them all over the world uh, around. But it would have been a number of, of things like that. and. Uh, uh, she is, is such a delight. I, I've done a couple of her radio programs, and uh, 
we, we've uh, been able to, to interact in that, uh, in that fashion. We were scheduled to do a South American historical uh, uh, cruise when she came down with, uh, with uh, breast, breast cancer. cancer. And we'd had yeah. everything set up to go. Well, you're, along the line of your travels, it you, sounds like, have you been on every continent? I have not been to Antarctica. I've been very close to Antarctica, but on some of the ice shelves off Antarctica uh, on, on a trip to Australia, but uh, that's the only one. Uh, I did an around the world uh, trip, uh, oh, about four or five years oh, ago. Around, which was 17 days on the Siberian Railroad. Oh, my. It, it, uh, was a, a, a unique way to see it. The, the train was kind of a local. Uh, we were towards the back, and there were five cars back there for people going all the way. Then up in front, they were, and, and, and in the middle was the dining car, the cook's car. Well, they wouldn't let people come up through the cook's car into, the, into our dining room. So we, we were fairly well uh, isolated. isolated. Uh, from uh, from uh, uh, folks coming in, so and every car had uh, sort of like going to be a stewardess, a young lady that uh, looked after you. And uh, when I got on, it's it's all electric, electric diesels. But I remember getting on, I said, "Boy, if that's an electric diesel, why does everything smell like uh, coal oh. smoke?" And uh, there. At the end of each car was a uh, what do they call it? Samaro? It's 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 a for heating tea mm -hmm. and that's and it's coal fired. And the gal doing it, she would have the the uh, the uh, fire up there, and it just permeated the coal smoke through the through the. But when you get off the train, uh, at, say we're coming to a little town, and you tell her uh, yes, she said okay, I'll lock your room up. And uh, you get out and spend as much time as, as you could. They'd blow the, the, the whistle a little of a warning. Better get back on. We're about to, about to pull out. And uh, she'd look after you. If you didn't show up on time, she'd be there at the, at the doorway. <laughs> no, no, we're not already in. I'm envious of your travel. Uh, Claude said that I really did need to say that you have been a wonderful volunteer for alumni relations group over in Ray Nicholson House. What is it that you do there? The, the volunteers, uh, of course, are not trained in, in, in all the aspects of the computerization of the, of the uh, uh, alumni society, but we've been associated with society long enough so that uh, uh, we could work uh, out in the reception and answer phone calls and be nice and uh, then there are routine things uh, that we got 500 of these that need to be stuffed in here and while you're there you can sit and stuff <laughs> those things in things that are, are at, at that at that uh, at that skill level uh, and uh, I, I i usually run the mail uh, on the days that i that i uh, work and uh, other things that just need doing. Uh, we all got our peculiar skills, and uh, one of mine is growing hair so that I look like Santa Claus. So I, I play the Santa Claus for them uh, around. But uh, I, I, I'm, I'm in a long list of very famous Santa Clauses. Uh, Claude was Santa Claus. <laughs> <laughs> well, I understood you did were a great Santa, and that you did it. Do you do it for other groups too, or just the alumni? Well, uh, I, I do it for other groups, but the... Is this a new career, Dr. Martin? Well, not, not really. Uh, if you get paid for it, you start getting in trouble. Uh, the liability insurance is so high. To be a Santa? To, yes. You see, when you put a child on your lap, already you've broken a whole lot of laws. Huh. And you can't hardly put your arms around that child. You had not broken a whole lot of more laws. All we need is an irate parent, and uh, the the uh, attorney, that's our, our attorney for, for, for the business, he said, don't do it publicly, and be very, and he had a case 
where a mother put the child up in the lap and the kid started screaming right away. And sure enough, on her backside were two big old pinch marks. And she's going, okay, sue the... Store or the whatever? The only thing that saved the old gentleman his rheumatism was so bad he couldn't get his fingers together. And then they discovered that this gal had already sued another mall, mm -hmm. same thing, and well, the judge went after her then because you did that and planted the kid up there, but you're guilty. I mean, there is practically no defense. Uh, so, so yeah, liability insurance. We've is become, good. we're in a sad place in the world when Santa, uh, you know, you know, Santa, uh, you know. But I, I, I do it for parades. I was, I was the Santa up in Royston. All right. And then I, I've got a friend, uh, Linda Buffington and her boyfriend, uh, they have a photography studio in Royston. And he's working on a thing where I pose in a number of situations and then, digitally, he'll add the kids back in. And they, because some children are frightened to death of Santa Claus. I don't know if somebody bearded one beat them or what. Uh, I was there, afraid of Santa, I understand. Just, uh, there, there's one child, they brought him back three years in a row. And he gets the door coming in to, uh, at, at the, and he's no not gonna way. Do this, huh? We're not going to do this. It's a strange situation. Well, Dr. Michaels, this has been, uh, as it always is, it has been a lot of fun. Is there, is, can you think of anything you'd like to add uh, to, or to an area that we may not have touched on? Or I, I, I really can't think of anything. Uh, uh, I, I'm so pleased uh, with, with our future right now. Uh, and Coach Rick thinks we're competitive, and Suzanne Yalcom thinks we're competitive for next year. Though she sure gave me a scare on the first meet, but uh, yeah. they're looking better. I think they're on the... No, I can always uh, end things with uh, go dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much.